Welcome to the Lutheran Radio Church Service. This broadcast is brought to you on this station every Sunday at this time. Thank you for listening. Good morning. My name is David Peters, and it is my privilege to serve as visitation pastor at Epiphany Lutheran Church in Racine, Wisconsin. Our Lutheran Radio Choir, under the direction of Marie Zelmer, will begin our service by singing hymn number 365 in Christian worship, entitled, Love Divine, All Love Excelling. the second Sunday in Lent, we focus our meditation on the nature and purpose of Jesus' mission in this sin-filled world. Our guest speaker this morning is the Reverend Jack Kelly, who serves as pastor at Our Savior's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Zion, Illinois. Stay tuned as Pastor Kelly talks about the tremendous value Jesus places on every single sinful soul in his sermon entitled, What would you give for your soul? We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to our bodies and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt our souls. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our living Lord, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lutheran Radio Choir will now sing hymn number 76, Jesus' Name of Wondrous Love. Jesus' Name of Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father 
asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen now to God's holy word as written by St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, chapter 5, beginning with the first verse. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our second lesson will serve as the text for Pastor Kelly's sermon this morning. It is written in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 8, beginning with the 31st verse. Glory be to you, O Lord. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Let us join in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Pastor Kelly will speak on the theme, What Would You Give for Your Soul? Immediately after our choir sings hymn number 120, What Wondrous Love Is This? What wondrous love is this? Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. Is it worth it? Think of all the decisions we make based on that criteria. Should I trade the old car in or have it repaired? Is it worth it? Will I use TurboTax or go to an accountant? Is it worth it? Should I go out for softball in my senior year of high school, even though I'll probably still sit the bench? Is it worth it? I'm already late for the Wednesday night Lent service. Is it worth it? Did you realize that not only our cognitive brains ask that question, but our sinful natures ask that same question, is it worth it? The problem with that is that our sinful nature will always answer the question with no. Is it worth it to get up early on Sunday? No. Is it worth it to give our generous offerings? No. Is it worth it to repress my anger and avoid cursing in vulgar language? No. You get the point. Or look at it this way. How would your sinful nature answer the question that Jesus puts before us in today's gospel? What would you give for your soul? your sinful nature will answer pretty much nothing. So you see why this is such a serious question and why we dare not assume that we will always answer it properly. Jesus asked you a most serious question this morning, and he also provides you with all the reason you need to answer it correctly. Here is Jesus' soul-searching question. What would you give for your soul? On a vacation up north of sorts, Jesus begins to drop heavy news in his disciples. It follows in the heels of the monumental confession of Peter, less than a year from Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Now you might think that this is nothing new for the disciples, but remember, they approached life the life of Jesus differently than we do. Right from the time that we of the 21st century see Jesus in Bethlehem's manger, we are reminded Jesus is going to die on the cross, not so for the disciples. They are sons of their age. They have political and social hopes for the Messiah. They assume that the Messiah will bring liberation and domination. To them, Jesus means goodbye to taxes for Rome and those repulsive legions of soldiers. They thought that the Messiah would come to deliver them from pagans. What Jesus said to them then about suffering, being rejected, and killed was something really new. 
And that is the way that Mark lays out the story. With this moment, Jesus was taking a different direction. He was starting a new theme to his ministry, and he did this with spectacular bluntness. He spoke plainly about this. Jesus was now speaking with boldness, not concealing with a parable or figure of speech. He was direct about serving up the information on this future. He said, in effect, I'm not just going to die. I will die at the hands of the people who should be embracing me. No, I will be rejected, tossed aside by them. They will see to my death, but I will rise in victory. In, in saying this, Jesus was testifying to the true mission of the Messiah. His life was not about political liberation, but a life of sacrifice and suffering. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And why shouldn't he? To Peter and the others, it was clear Jesus was under too much stress. He was beginning to lose it. Jesus needed more than a general reminder. He needed a word of, of judgment, a, a rebuke for thinking that his life would go in such a depressing direction. And the majority of the people on membership lists in church today agree with Peter. On any given Sunday, the majority of our membership list is not gathered to hear about the cross. Even fewer join to make a special trip to the cross on Wednesdays in Lent. Even when some churches provide supper, people still say no thanks. An unexpected retort from Jesus. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God or the things of men. How could Jesus call one of his own disciples Satan? Well, when his disciple thinks and acts like the devil, it is appropriate. Recall last week how the devil tempted Jesus to take the easy road and avoid the pain of the cross. All Jesus had to do is compromise just once and worship the devil. In holy zeal, Jesus would have nothing to do with that path. He had in mind the things of God, love that was relentless, the path of sacrifice for sinners and atonement as our substitute. The things of God involved nothing but pain and scorn in order to serve us with salvation. By contrast, the things of man are just the opposite. We want to have it our way, the easy way. We make it all about us and expect good to come to us at little or no price. The things of men are glamorous award ceremonies, the Oscars, all-star games, our names on our marquee. Jesus would not be deterred from paying the ultimate price. He rejected the thinking of man because it was only a distraction from his mission. The Son of Man came to earth to seek and save and give his life as a ransom. His mission was you, and the dire consequences of sin demanded nothing less than total commitment. Glory be to Jesus, who never had anything less than the things of God on his mind. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We cannot tell if this was a strange thing to the disciples' ears. Was it a common expression to talk about crosses? Or was Jesus starting a new phrase here by using the word cross? We do know that through the centuries, some Christians have taken Jesus' words literally. In the Middle Ages, it was quite common to set up church naves and outdoor shrines with pictures of the stages of the cross. It's sometimes called Via Crucis, the way of the cross, or Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows. Depending on what shrine you go to, there are anywhere from seven to 30 stages of the cross where Christians could pray and meditate on Christ's suffering. It's not a bad idea to meditate on the suffering and death of Jesus. In fact, it's, it's good to do it. And the season of Lent is designed for that purpose. However, we are in no special favor with God by doing it regardless what Pope Pius XI might tell us. It is better to understand Jesus' words as figurative when he says that we have to take up a cross and follow him. He is expressing the truth that true followers of Christ will imitate the direction of Christ's life, a life of sacrifice and delayed glory. The way of Christ is to act like you have no connection with your wants and desires. You turn your back to them, in the interest of serving someone else's wishes. That is what it means to follow Jesus. To underscore that lesson, Jesus speaks a proverb that is a paradox. 
For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. The whole thing hinges on the word life. Some understand life to be about personal wishes and goals. The people who constantly chase after those things will end up losing them and so much more. That is because real life is about the wishes and goals of God. His goal is different than your goal. He wants your life to receive the spiritual blessings of forgiveness of sins, new spiritual life, and salvation in heaven. In the end, those are the only things that matter because those are the only gifts that keep on giving throughout eternity. No, in his goodness, God won't let us pursue our natural goals of self-glory and self-service. They produce nothing that is lasting and nothing that helps other people enjoy those everlasting gifts. It really boils down to this. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The devil is selling counterfeits. Most people are totally unaware of it. The counterfeit might be a new car, a championship trophy, a flashy smartphone, or just some frozen custard. But the price the devil asks is always the same, your soul. He wants you to consider your soul's salvation worth nothing. And that's pretty easy to do. You can't see your soul, you can't touch it, and you can't buy a new one to replace it. Yet God and his word are strong enough to help you see new priority. That is why God, the Holy Spirit, constantly wants to feed your soul. As our bodies get nourishment from a good square meal, so our souls are sustained by God's law and gospel. One would think that people could see that feeding our souls is, is all that really matters. But for most people, it isn't even on their radar. What accounts for that? Well, Jesus knows, and he shares his secret with us. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. It all has to do with shame. The world is ashamed to identify with Jesus' cross. The truth is that they know they are bad, but they're ashamed to admit it. They are ashamed to admit that they need a Savior. They are ashamed to have to repent, and sometimes to face embarrassment and persecution for the sake of a Savior. What a blessing that Jesus holds out a remedy for that shame. He reminds us, the future glory that will be ours when he returns with holy angels in glory. He reminds us that we will shine like stars in the moment when it really counts. At the judgment of all people, God will claim us as his own and show us that it was worth every sacrifice and shame. He gives us the answer to the question, what would you give for your soul? Everything. Yes, everything. And so we can sing with God's people and mean every word of it. Ashamed of Jesus? Yes, I may, when I have no guilt to wash away, no tear to wipe, no good to crave, no fear to quell, no soul to save. Amen. Let us now join together and pray the prayer our Savior has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The Lutheran Radio Committee is pleased to offer you a copy of today's sermon by Pastor Jack Kelly. If you would like a free copy, or if you'd like to sponsor one of our weekly worship services, please write to us. You may send your tax-deductible contribution to the Lutheran Radio Committee, P.O. Box 501, Brookfield, Wisconsin, 53008. 
That is the Lutheran Radio Committee, Box 501 Brookfield, 53008. We'd love to have you check out our website at www.lrcsonline.org. You have been listening to the Lutheran Radio Church Service, coming from the chapel at Wisconsin Lutheran College. Your liturgist was the Reverend David Peters. The Lutheran Radio Choir will now close by singing hymn number 579, Lift High the Cross. May our triune God richly bless your Lenten devotion as the whole Christian church on earth ponders the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Preceding service was brought to you by the Lutheran Radio Church Service, broadcasting radio church services every Sunday morning since 1928. You may request a copy of this morning's sermon. Please pray for this important ministry. Prayerfully consider donating any amount the Lord enables you to give to this Christ-centered gospel ministry. Please mail your gift to the Lutheran Radio Church Service, Box 501, Brookfield, Wisconsin, 53008. That's the Lutheran Radio Church Service, Box 501, Brookfield, Wisconsin, 53008. Thank you for your generous support of the Lutheran Radio Church Service, and may God bless your day.